it's a real pleasure. I very much appreciated the invitation to come out and share our research and meet with everyone today. It's been a great conversation going all day. I had no idea this is an hour earlier than it should be. If you had told me that, I would have flown out in the morning or something, but I'm trying to fly back west. And you can actually do it. You can actually do it, uh, uh, you know, going that way. So uh, building a mind for cancer, um, the, the, the premise or the, the sort of point of departure for this talk is, is a common point of departure, I think, for a lot of people's talks, uh, including at the Broad. Um, and, you know, it, it really revolves around this, this long-standing struggle to understand genetic heterogen, uh, heterogeneity in diseases like cancer. Arguably, it, it, maybe the is too strong a word here, but still one of the major unsolved challenges of genomics and its, its applications to precision medicine and oncology. Um, people talk about within tumor heterogeneity, between tumor heterogeneity. I'm going to focus mainly between tumors, but much of what I'm talking about, if not everything I'm going to talk about, as the data become available, will apply, I, I believe, and I think you know, that's, it's, it's generalizable uh, uh, to, to uh, within clone, you know, looking at clonal heterogeneity in, in a tumor as well. Uh, to illustrate this heterogeneity, uh, I'm not the first person to stand in this room, I'm sure, and show these long tails of tumor mutation plots. This happens to be from the Cancer Genome Atlas colorectal cancer cohort. About 500 patients uh, were sequenced uh, both in their tumor and in the, the normal tissue to, to look at these somatic uh, mutations in a subtractive analysis and the top four most frequently mutated genes in colorectal cancer in this cohort are here. Uh, of course, I'm just sorting the, the uh, genes in decreasing order of that. Um, these are all very uh, well-known, infamous uh, cancer genes already. Uh, but then uh, th this problem with heterogeneity is that once you're beyond those four, you're very quickly into the land of genes that are mutated in under 10% of patients and then under 5% of patients. So said a different way, and again, I'm not the first person to stand up here and say this, every cancer may present with sort of a, what appears to be a monolithic phenotype, but all of the genotypes are fundamentally different to our first order. And so how do we deal with this fact that cancer and, and these types of diseases are, are fundamentally different diseases at the molecular level at this layer of granularity? Well, the, the uh, foreshadowing of everything I'm going to talk about already has appeared. And it's already appeared because uh, we see the gene names here, like PIK3CA, PIK3R1. This is one of the subunits that's the catalytic subunit of the PI3K enzyme, okay? one of the major signals for proliferation in, in tumor cells. Here is a regulatory subunit of that same enzyme okay? that's frequently, that, you know, one's more frequently mutated than the other, but they're both uh, getting hit to, uh, to drive cancer. Other, uh, other uh, genes that go together I could have labeled not just SMAD3, but a bunch of subunits of what are larger SMAD complexes here, uh, all of which individually analyzed are relatively rare mutations, but when you start to put them together into systems, they really start to add up. And so maybe what's going on here is the selective pressure in cancer is not at the gene level, it's at the larger subunit, larger machine level. And, you know, that is not a new idea either. You know, I think Bob Weinberg or something told us about the hallmarks of cancer many years ago. And even that review article arguably was summarizing, you know, the, the conventional wisdom at the time that cancer was a disease of pathways, not of any individual mutation or, or gene. The question, though, is how do we define those hallmarks? And then two, you know, precisely. And then how do we use those precisely defined hallmarks to, uh, in, in information systems for translating the cancer genome? And those two questions are really at the heart of, of my talk today. And by the end of my talk, what I will, or somewhere in the middle, what I will approach is translating maps of frequently mutated cancer genes to using knowledge of frequently mutated protein machines which we've just decided to call protein assemblies. Somehow a protein complex evokes too small of a word. A gene module is too vague. Uh, these are physical uh, assemblies of proteins and cells, uh, but that can live at multiple scales. And we'll see that uh, these are big, big and small machines. But as soon as you start putting proteins together in the same functional structural unit, then you can obviously start to aggregate mutations and look for protein complexes that represent the convergence points of said mutational pressure. 
Okay, so just theoretically, the idea would be that if we have a complex of, of four subunits, A through D, any one of these uh, uh, mutational uh, loads may be relatively rare, you know, but uh, if you, and maybe you have one that's more frequently mutated than the others, maybe that, uh, you know, uh, 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 met some FDR threshold that, that allowed it to be detected. But, uh, but by recognizing now we have another object of biology, Carolina, as you were talking about this morning, what are the objects of biology? Uh, we have uh, a test we can do at that level. Uh, and, and so the result of, of a bunch of those tests, and this is not a, a, a sort of pie in the sky workup, this is actually a result coming from some of what I'm gonna show you today. Here is what that assembly level landscape looks like for colorectal cancer. And so again, maybe not surprisingly, but it's good to see one of them, you know, pretty much every colorectal cancer has some coding mutation in the machinery of beta catenin destruction complex, right? And that's again, maybe not surprising, Good to see, again, uh, another very frequent uh, and infamous cancer pathway. And here again, you're catching many mutations. Uh, and look at, look at how the, the, the overall frequency uh, scale in this axis now goes all the way up to one. And you have a, quite a number of assemblies that are mutated in more than 50% of the population. OK, so that's, that's the sort of concept. So, so now, where do we get? So, so the first question that's begged is, where do we get these maps of assemblies? And how are we all going to agree on them and survey them, them properly? OK, and, and we're definitely at the early days of that. Um, you know, uh, lots of people before me as well have shown, uh, have illustrated the point like this. So we, we know that the, you know, there are the famous back-to-back -back, uh, original human genome papers published in about 2001. Um, that's been many times alike into a parts list, those 20,000 parts, right? What we actually want in this case is to move beyond those parts to the sort of Chilton's manual of the car, you know, uh, uh, you know, what are, how do each of those parts assemble into larger and larger subunits in the chassis, in the engine, uh, in the drivetrain, and, and, and the braking system, and so on and so forth that make up this beautiful Mark I Volkswagen Golf. I have a Mark VII electric golf that's just been discontinued. Uh, OK, so uh, well, let's dispense with the analogy and let's go to where we might find these, these assembly manuals of how proteins go together. So the first place that you might go is PDB. OK, no surprise. So you open up PDB and you see classic structures like the proteasome and each one of these colored uh, subunits is encoded by a distinct gene product. There's the core of the proteasome, there's the regulatory uh, uh, ends of the proteasome and several folds of, symmer of, of symmetry. Here is a, a protein uh, a complex that was published more recently during the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, epidemic with the RNA included. But what, you know, what, what fraction of all machines, even of this size, do we feel are represented by PDB? We've seen AlphaFold now promise to fold single proteins. We've even seen AlphaFold begun to be applied to folding pairs of interacting proteins. We have not yet talked about larger, okay? And, and of course, you can get much larger, all the way up to organelles and cells and tissues. So how do we fold a cell is really you know, one, one way of phrasing the question, especially when we know, you know it, it's, it's, it's hard to estimate how many complexes we don't know, but we certainly know of a very large uh, 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 syncytia of proteins, if you like, like the synapse. The synapse has more than a thousand distinct gene products, uh, of which maybe a third have some knowledge in the public databases about them. Otherwise, we just know they kind of land at the presynaptic density or the postsynaptic density and so on, um, very far from getting to anything like a structure of, of, of the synapse. And of course, uh, the fear is, or the sort of the suspicion one has is that that's more the, the uh, uh, it, that's, that's more the rule than the exception when you're talking about how much structure we, we know. Um, so the, the, the main subject of this, so I'm now to kind of the main subject of, of, of the talk. And the, the main thing I want to talk about today is an, uh, a sort of early, because there's no claims made here of, of anything permanent. This is, I, I'm sure, transient. This is just where you know, uh, our lab and our collaborators are today, but an early end-to-end -end pipeline for how you might get at this mesoscale cell structure for a tumor cell population uh, that you could then use to analyze the cancer genome. Uh, 
in, in much the way I've described. Um, the two main types of data that we put into this pipeline at the moment, again, it's, it's what's working well now, um, but I'm happy to talk about challenges and problems, is uh, twofold. Uh, we use protein interaction mass spectrometry, and we use protein immunofluorescent confocal imaging, uh, two ways of positioning proteins in cells which then get, uh, get uh, integrated together to build these not yet 3D exact structural uh, uh, positioning of all the parts of, of, of tumor cells, but nonetheless what start to look more like data-driven ontologies of all of their parts that are resolvable in these integrated data sets. And then we feed these ontologies of cell parts into deep learning systems for ultimately clinical precision oncology. And I'm going to try to touch on each of these uh, uh, today a little bit. So let's talk, um, let's talk uh, just briefly about the structural aspect here at, at the beginning. Um, and, and this is work that was uh, done uh, by Yue Chen, who's here in the audience and is now a Schmidt Fellow here. Say hi, Yue, if you, if you don't know her. Um, and make sure you do uh, in, in this talk. Um, so this is her graduate work, and uh, you know. So what you know, her her innovation here, in, in my view, is to recognize that we have these two, call them, you know, um, leading edge, not so much bleeding edge, but leading edge of two major pillars of cell interrogation. My, you know, we have four hundred years of microscopy that we're resting on here that have produced things like confocal microscopes and the ability to immunofluorescently stain target proteins. You know, so here we're looking in green at, at some target protein that'll change from protein to protein, ultimately covering all 20,000 proteins, Um And then we, we have three counter stains typically, and, and here, as you'll see in a second, we're collaborating in this particular project with the Human Protein Atlas and Emma Lundberg there, uh, uh, who has this library of two to five antibodies they've developed to most, covering most human proteins. So you get a couple of shots on goal. They are polyclonal and people argue about that, but at least from a machine learning point of view, I have a couple of shots on goal here to look for outliers, which has been quite, I think, helpful uh, to, to do and to have those, those multiple shots. Um, and so here we're counter staining microtubules and nuclear staining and so on. And, um, and that's the bleeding edge or the leading edge of, of where their imaging pipeline is. Uh, now, that's, that's the left-hand side. What about the right-hand side? It's a complementary way of positioning proteins. This is the biochemistry approach, okay? So biochemists don't look at stuff under microscopes in 2D. They grind stuff up in blenders, and they run it over columns, okay? And in this case, we still have antibodies involved. In this case, our antibody is attached to a bead. You pull down the, the target protein here in biochemical lingo called a bait, and then you see what sticks. And to identify what sticks, you use tandem mass spectrometry. And so, uh, and here are, we have a, a number of collaborators. First, I'll talk about Stephen uh, Gigi and, and Wade Harper and Ed Hutland's groups across uh, the river here, who we've collaborated with on this project. Um, and then we also collaborate quite frequently with David Krogan's lab at UCSF uh, to do this kind of affinity purification mass spectrometry. So, so back to the, the, the insight here, there, there had been you know, uh, numbers of papers where they do a lot of imaging and then they validate a hypothesis coming out of that with a pull down or papers where they had done a lot of pull downs and then validated a few hypotheses with, with imaging. But uh, no one yet, as to our knowledge, had, had taken both big data streams and tried to put them together. And maybe one reason is like, well, why, why would you want to? Um, but I think once you realize that they're basically protein positioned two ways, one's kind of global relative to the cell, the other is local relative to, to your, your neighborhood in the cell, although you lose global information, then, then you can kind of see a way forward. Uh, and so I, I won't go into the, the you know, I, I'm flying high here, I realize, but I want to cover a lot. So please ask me questions later if you, if you are, are interested in this or you, uh, you can field those questions yourself. Um, but, but the idea here is, is, is now uh, we can use an emerging uh, technique uh, that you've heard out of Caroline's lab as well and others uh, around here called co-embedding where you embed not just one big data stream, but you embed multiple data streams, in this case, just two uh, together. Of course, having done that, you can easily imagine 
what should be the third data that, uh, a set that, are, that, that gets embedded this way. Um, but the idea, and I, I don't think I have to explain an embedding to anyone in this audience because, uh, of course, a UMAP, as is used to look at single cell RNA-seq data, is a type of an embedding. It's a reduced representation of, of complex input data uh, that try to extract, in this case, biological meaning. Um, in this case, uh, a point is not a cell as it is in single cell RNA-seq. It's a protein. Okay? And the position of, of a protein in that space is governed by its, its, its protein location or distribution, 2D distribution in the cell population and its interaction neighborhood. So it's said a different way, two neighboring proteins in this space, if you go back and do the check, you better be able to verify that their images look the same. And if they're not directly interacting, they're, they're at least in close proximity to many of the same friends. That, and that they're interacting with. Okay, so that's the sort of notion of this co-embedding. And then given this co-embedding, we can then cluster it not at one scale, but across uh, uh, all scales, okay, simultaneously to pick out small uh, complexes nested inside of larger complexes nested inside of big assemblies, organelles, and finally at the top you reach, you reach the cell. We call this the multi-scale integrated cell or music. Um, just to call your attention, a paper came out about six months later from the CZI folks called Open Cell. Very similar uh, projects in, in, um, in concept. Um, I like some things better about their data and, and methods, and I like some things better about our data and methods, and we can talk about, about that as well. But I think for the points, or, you know, the, the, the point I'm making here, they're, they're sister projects. So let me give you an example. You know, so here, here is an example of clustering in that embedding, uh, starting with a small resolution parameter and then dialing up that, that resolution parameter. So we start here in the neighborhood of Jim and seven, and at, at, you know, from one to 10 nanometer resolution, you pick up a dense community of four proteins. You then raise your, your resolution parameter. This is getting dialed up con basically continuously, okay, all the way up. Um, and so now up around, say, 20 nanometers, we're picking up some more neighbors in this sort of virtual snot ball that we're pulling down here, okay? And then notice something very interesting happens between 20 and 200 nanometers, okay? And of course, where exactly it happens, I could specify, but it's, it's in that range. You take two communities, clusters, that were separately forming, and now they've combined into, into a very large cluster that now at this resolution is the same cluster. If we look, and I'll show uh, the structure of this in just a second, we have now recapitulated using imaging and proteomic mass spectrometry the, 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 the pre-catalytic uh, pre splicesome, and this is the U1 and this is the U2 subunit that has just come, come together. Of course, this is happening all over the map at the same time. Oh, and I, I, should, I, I have to go back and admit uh, one thing. Uh, so uh, when we started this project, we we collaborated with the two largest uh, repositories of fluorescent imaging for proteins and uh, APMS for proteins. That was the Lundberg group with HPA and the Hutland, Harper, and Gigi groups with, with Bioplex. But their projects had not been aligned because people weren't trying to integrate these, these two data sets. We did, however, have uh, some overlap in those very large data sets in one cell line in particular, HEC-293 human embryonic cells. Uh, or, uh, kidney cells. Um, and so we had, so everything you're seeing is actually just 700 proteins. It's a proof of concept in 700 proteins. Um, now that these are aligned, now what's happened is the HPA and Bioplex have, have now um, coordinated. So the next bolus of data is going to be about 10x greater in a common cell, cell background. But that's, that's not, not ready yet. Uh, but that's, that's what all of us are working on at the moment. Um, Here's, so so the, all of this is to say this is for HEC-293s, and this is just 700 proteins, okay? Um, given that, we can detect about 66 objects of cell biology in the integrated data. Um, one other detail that's important, because this is all physical data, both of these are physical or structural in nature, I can calibrate distance in my embedding to nanometers, okay? which is a pretty, I thought, cool thing to, to be able to do. Uh, and the way I can do that is because for some of these clump, clumps of proteins, I do have PDB structures or some literature evidence that, that allows me to, to say what, what the diameter of that component should be 
inside of the cell. And it turns out it, it, it works well enough that you can get a sort of calibration. Now, I should say this is not calibrated in the two dimensions of the UMAP. There's a larger number of dimensions here that this, the true embedding uh, represents, and that's where that calibration is, is done. But for that reason, I can put a size ladder over here on the, size, uh, on the side of the hierarchy, which is roughly the, 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 at least the estimate of this analysis for the size of those, of those components. And then lastly, I can then go through and start to uh, name components that are well, that, that clearly correspond to well-documented uh, components in the cell biology literature. Um, the first thing you do there is the usual thing. You do go enrichment or, or its ilk, right? And then you, you can name uh, well-enriched uh, 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 components here, and those are all of the yellow ones. Um, and then all the purple ones had enough novelty, you know, were different enough, either entirely different or were, were sufficiently different from, from known complexes and larger cell assemblies that, that we, we, we called them candidate novel. And then you can start to follow up on, on some of those. But first, let me just, uh, l let me just uh, you, know, uh, show, you know, show you the evidence that we think we can calibrate this thing to, to distance in the structure. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or so uh, uh, cell components that were left out, so were held out of the calibration. UA can then bring them back and show that uh, the predicted diameter, having calibrated our embedding in our system, is pretty close to the, the actual diameter of that component as, as, uh, as estimated in the literature. She can perform bootstrapping of her whole system, and we can talk about exactly how we do that uh, to get a, a not just one, and here we're giving you kind of the average, but there's a range that we can estimate via techniques like statistical bootstrapping of, of the thing. So here, this shows an example of that pre-catalytic spliceosome again. This is the entire spliceosome as it's structured in, in, in the online you know, PDB type databases. Um, if you remember, we only have 700 proteins, and so we don't get all these components. The colored ones are the ones that are actually in the music map. The gray ones are not yet in the music map. Okay, but nonetheless, using the, the, the handful of proteins uh, that, that were in the map, we estimate that the, uh, the diameter of this thing is 26 to 90 nanometers. It also gives you kind of, you know, the confidence interval there. And the measured diameter of this in the literature is 42 nanometers. Um, now, I mentioned um, we're now applying this to actually U2OS cells. It's kind of the new target. And um, it's about a tenfold larger data set. Um, back when back when we had this map, so so you know I, I talked about using go enrichment to try to name all the the yellow uh, uh, terms. The the problem with go enrichment is it always fails, and go enrichment always fails for exactly one of two reasons. Either go enrichment tells you there's a well enriched term, in which case you can name it, but it's not novel. So it's not going to serve to get your paper published or to follow up on in any meaningful way. It's already well known. The other way go enrichment fails is because it fails to find enrichment. So then what do you do? You sit there in front of your computer. How many people have sat with the gene set in your life and tried to figure out hypotheses as to what that gene set is actually doing? I do it all the time. I spend hours in my life doing, doing this where you try to come up with hypotheses as to what a novel gene set, whether it's coming out of you know, proteomics imaging approaches like this or gene expression clusters or the set of genes that when knocked down with CRISPR had some phenotype, yada, yada, yada. You know, we all live and breathe gene, gene sets. Um, could we automate, especially with the advent of GPT type large language models, this process? So what do you do when, when Go enrichment fails? And it always fails, okay? Uh, uh, and so, so here's an example where we simply are, and, and we've put this, uh, Clara Hu uh, has, has taken this part over uh, in, in the lab, and so she just posted this paper uh, uh, just a few weeks ago on archive. Um, we'll see how well it, it, it does. I think the, the reason I'm worried is because GPT-4 itself is so hard to pin down. Um, you know, uh, any conclusions we draw may change, I think would be my self-criticism. But I would, in response to that, say we have a pretty interesting finding here for what, what one can do now with the current state of, of, of LLM. Um, so what, what she does is she simply says, OK, well, let's first see if we can recapitulate well-known components documented by, by databases like the gene ontology. And so here's one. She says, you know, 
chat GPT, oh, great one, you know, um, you know, here's a list of genes. Can you please write me? Uh, so, so under the presumption that there is a common function to these genes, can you please give me a succinct label in less than 10 words? And can you write a thousand word essay rationalizing your choice with citations? Okay. Um, does it hallucinate? Okay. Less than I had thought. And then the second thing the team did to cut down on hallucination was ask ChatGPT for a second time, um, pasting in all these results, please find errors in this, in this uh, account and, uh, and check the, you know, it, are, there, are there false citations here, basically. And that actually cleans it up quite a bit, and I'm happy to talk. So, so I think what, what this paper really is is, a, is like a social it's like a social study of, of, of a creature called, you know, of the behavior of an LLM with regard to this, this question. Um, for our goal, though, we had 250 complexes to research. And rather than spend days per complex, you know, and it, in fact, we had a jamboree. We had like 10 people working on the project. We all gathered um, in a room for a couple of days and started reading literature. But then in the middle of that meeting, she introduced this tool, and everyone just picked it up and you're working from this, you're not trying to reach you know, towards this by the end of the meeting. We kind of started the meeting essentially with, with these suggestions and, 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 uh, and justification paragraphs. So here's an example where it gets pretty close. This is not a novel one. This is just recapitulating a, uh, a term in Go. But you know, if, you, if you really read its analysis, it's pretty good and it's, it's not often wrong. Um, Anyway, happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A. Um, um, the other thing I'll say, I'm not going to go into this study in any detail, uh, so uh, other than to pivot in two ways. So, um, so we've started now, um, instead of looking at HEC-293s, as I said, we're now moving into cancer cells. I mentioned U2OS. Um, if you're just talking about APMS, the proteomics layer, we're actually much further ahead than that. So we've been spending the last five to 10 years um, generating maps of cancer cells using APMS, uh, pulling down endemous cancer proteins, okay? And so um, I won't talk much about that today because I, I've actually become convinced that we're gonna have to integrate imaging in almost all of that, and that's exactly what we're going back to do. Um, but nonetheless, we're, you know, uh, we're, we're forging ahead with the protein-protein interaction screens where we are ahead, uh, at least as respects, uh, right, you know, as involves cancer. Um, and building, you know, here's a DNA damage response, uh, a bunch of DNA damage response pull downs across uh, breast cancer and head and neck cancer cell lines, where we can also hit it with the DNA damaging agent and look at how these protein complexes, which are now just based on APMS, I should say, are remodeled. But what I really put this on here to, to do is to illustrate uh, another alternative visualization that, that people have been working on, which take the, it takes these hierarchies and instead of of just showing the sort of dendrogram of, of you know, factoring a cell into organelles and then into smaller and smaller pieces. You can kind of look down the barrel of that, of that dendrogram um, at nested protein sets. And so here we've zoomed in a little far, but right down here barely you can see the sort of border of the circle meant to represent the entire cell. And then within that uh, 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 collection of, pro, of you know, cell-wide proteomic data, you now uh, have a bunch of nested, this nested hierarchy of circles, each representing a smaller and smaller object of cell biology that's been detected and, you know, their putative or, or more confident names. Um, so just, and, you know, and then you can kind of pivot between the actual raw network evidence and the, the, uh, the resulting cellular object that's inferred from, from that, that raw evidence. Um, now that we have cancer maps, or once, once you have cancer maps of, of protein complexes, we can now get back to this question I started my talk on, which is how do we use those maps to interpret the cancer genome? This is an example of a, another complex that's not novel. It's, it's recapitulated from our, our mapping efforts um, that was not known, however, to, to be under any kind of meaningful genetic pressure or genetic selection in cancer genomes, but it turns out to be under striking genetic selection 
in several cancer types. And that is the, the, this, this is the recapitulated complex, again, not yet with imaging data for this one, um, but, but coming out of the cancer studies. Uh, uh, and this, by the way, I should say, this mass spectrometry has been done in, in, in collaboration with Daniel Sweeney, Min Q Kim, and Nevin Krogan's lab. In Nevin Krogan's lab. Um, uh, we've recapitulated the cluster of collagens. Uh, the, as, you, as you may know, collagens are the dominant uh, component of the ECM or extracellular matrix through which tumors grow and ultimately may metastasize. If you look at the kind of cell biology textbook version of, of this, the reason these all pull out is because when you form collagen fibers, you basically pick threes of collagens and you form this triple alpha, uh, alpha helical structure that's shown there. And then those, like a rope, braid together and braid together again to create this collagenous fiber. So that's what you're actually looking at when we pull it out and represent it like yay in our protein complexes proteomics map. Okay, fair enough. But because that does come down as an object of cell biology, I can now perform these tests at the complex level for mutational pressure on that object. Okay, And so it turns out that uh, in a couple of cancer types, melanoma, this, uh, you have a coding mutation, typically several, uh, in, one of, uh, in one or more of these collagen uh, subunits in 70 plus percent of, of, of melanoma, 50 percent of lung adenocarcinoma. Okay, and just to show you what the individual gene level looks like in lung adenocarcinoma, that's the mutation burdens on each of those, of those collagen subunits. I saw this result and I said, wait a minute, there's no way 21% 20, mutation frequency was missed by TCGA. But of course it was because the mutation burden of, of this disease is very high. And so if you look back, it's in the long tail. So it's, there's many other genes that had a greater mutation burden than, than collagen A1. Maybe it was, it was you know, in the border, border line, but of course there were many, um, many much more mutated fruits that that paper went after and, and this didn't make the cut. Once again, you put it all together and you get a very striking signal. Now you might be thinking, well, Trey, but what do I expect by chance? And so of course you have to run those statistics. And in fact, I was talking with Gaddy this morning because we simply used his MUTSIG algorithm it, it can output, if you, if you insert the right print line in his code, it can output the expected number of mutations every gene should have in a given disease. And that's what we use to make sure that we're well above that expected number as a, as a complex. I, again, I know I'm, I'm glossing over details, but feel free to, to ask me about them. Um, but that then, of course, led to a, a, a hypothesis that, that mutations in this complex are somehow important for, for cancer. Um, what I don't have shown on this slide, but you can read about in this paper, first author of this paper, Fan Jing, he was a structural biologist uh, before he came to my lab to do a postdoc. And so he knew all the tricks of the trade with doing energetic modeling of collagen mutations in the structure. And he could show that the vast majority of these were happening right in that triple alpha helix and resulted in a, in a massive predicted destabilization of, of that helix. Uh, so we then collaborated with Stephanie Fraley's lab at UCSD and, and in particular, Marissa Heinschel in her lab, who uh, Stephanie is, is well versed and, and has geared much of her lab around matrix models and call, you know, um, ECM models and cancer. And so what she was set up to do is, is we went in and knocked in uh, three different mutations that arise in patients. Um, you, she has a workhorse cell line uh, that, that once you've cloned that mutation in, lays down collagen, that mutant collagen in the, uh, uh, you know, in the ECM. Um, we can do that, of course, without that mutation. We then decellularize and now seed back into both environments a common cell line. In this case, it was A549 lung cancer cells. You can then watch the behavior of those cells using different markers. I, my, my main hypothesis was uh, cell migration was going to be the phenotype we were looking for. It was no different between mutant and, and wild type collagen. Uh, what was was cell proliferation, as, as noted by this KI67 marker. OK, so um, I'm about 2 thirds of the way through. Um, and, I, and I'm now going to shift from structure to, to function. So uh, thus far, I've um, you know, talked about kind of getting to this ability to map these hierarchies of protein machines in a given target uh, cell type and indicated kind of hints of why that might be important for understanding cancer genomics. But how formally might we do that in, in, uh, in systems uh, that try to, 
use the cancer genome to do things like match patients to, to drugs. Um, and uh, this is, uh, of course, a task that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, the particular contribution we thought we could make with these kinds of, this kind of mapping approach was perhaps we could build machine learning systems that if we teach them not just how to match patterns of mutations in, in tumor genomes to uh, predicted outcomes, for instance, a predicted response or non-response to a given drug, um, many groups interested in doing that, um, Deep learning and, and its successors, of course, hold lots of promise and power for doing that. Um, but people often complain about what's written right here, the, uh, the aspect that, that these approaches are typically very difficult to interpret. Okay? It might be able to tell you that your patient you know, is, is going to die tomorrow unless you give drug A but not X, Y, and Z. Um, and then it has to say, but I have no idea why. You know, that's not acceptable. Okay? So, so the thought was, can you also somehow get knowledge of this tumor cell biology and these higher order systems into these maps, which also are how people talk about the effects of mutations? Oh, you've knocked out this pathway, so you should clearly hit with this drug, right? And so here is, we, we worked out a succession of approaches starting with this Nature Methods paper in 2018. Um, this was actually demonstrated in yeast, uh, but by 2020, we had reduced it to, to predicting drug response in cancer cells. Ellie Van Allen's lab had a paper, I think, a year after this, where they applied this approach to prediction of, of uh, metastatic versus non-metastatic prostate cancer. Um, so please do check that out as well. But the way the basic approach works, it's very similar in spirit to convolutional neural networks, if you know something about those. So what is a convolutional neural network? Um, the prior knowledge it has is the structure of your features in an image. So it's not like you feed an image and you just linearize all the pixels in, you know, in any order and scramble them and give it to a neural network. That's how normal neural networks work, by the way. No, you hold the, the 2D structure of the image constant and each of the input neurons or banks of neurons sees a field of view, right? It's exactly like that, except those fields of view are defined by these hierarchies of cellular components. Um, also related to this type of method would be a graphical neural network, okay? And I, one wonders, uh, someone should really go in and compare explicitly these different representations. We haven't. But just to show you sort of what's working uh, moderately well on our hands right now is we have this hierarchy that we can define through these structural means. You, of course, can also define these hierarchies from, from literature curated pathway databases like Reactome. That's what the Van Allen lab did. Um, Go. Um, you can think about the genome as essentially, and all the somatic mutations there, as inputs to these, these uh, nested uh, uh, assemblies and cells. And then by the time you get down to the, the cell itself, uh, that can be in interpreted at least as a single cell output. Uh, and so if you're going to be uh, training this thing on, say, cell line proliferation in response to drugs, which is exactly what we did, you can stop at the cell level. Of course, one can imagine going further in the future. Um, but the idea here is shown over here right. The core idea is now that every object of cell biology coming out of a structural pipeline is assigned a bank of neurons to represent the state of that object under a given cancer genome. Okay. Um, and so, for instance, the, the consortium of complexes that's been called here kind of glibly DNA repair, and it might factor into sub-complexes involved in double-stranded break repair and basic excision repair and so on, all of each of those gets a bank of neurons to now uh, functionalize that object. And, and then uh, uh, when we train our neural network, you'll essentially optimize the, uh, the weights uh, between uh, the daughter or the, the, the subunits of that process and the state of the process itself. We do not allow any, uh, any uh, non-zero weights to be learned that don't respect this hierarchy. Okay? Um, and that's, that's how the thing works. And then how do we train the input-output function? We use the depth map style resources developed in part here and part at the Sanger Center. And, and, uh, and largely, I'm going to group all of those together. I know the word depth map is sort of becoming bigger and bigger over time to mean more and more things. Here, when I say the word depth map, I'm talking about about a thousand tumor cell lines for which you know the somatic. Uh, somatic is a good question, but you know the mutations, and and you know uh, about a thousand drugs that have been applied to, to those for each of those thousand by a thousand. 
uh, combinations, you have a uh, uh, area under dose response curve. You have the entire dose response curve that we simply used the area. Okay, so I can train, I can train a machine learning system to try to convert somatic muta or, uh, mutations in genotype to, to drug responses. But uh, here, in a, spe in a sort of in a unique way, I'm doing it through the visible circuitry of, of the cancer cell. Um, and now uh, that, that's where we, this is all taken from published work, and now I'm going to show you some papers we have in review uh, that are kind of the latest at, at trying to do that. Um, so here is a model built to explain the response to, to predict and hopefully interpret slash explain the response to CDK4-6 inhibitors like palbociclib. As you may or may not know, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors are a standard of care in advanced breast cancer. Uh, and uh, like a lot of these targeted uh, situations, uh, you of course have patients who respond and many patients who do not respond. So first, can we predict who's not going to respond? And uh, and can we uh, and starting in these big cell line repositories uh, like DepMap type uh, cell line repositories where you have a lot of data, but then can you uh, seeing a, 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 an ability there, can you now translate that ability into clinical data, at least retrospective clinical data? And we also try to do it in PDXs. Uh, in interest of time, I'm not going to present all of, but, but let's just focus. So, so we, we train on cell lines. I wouldn't be talking to you about this particular example if, if the cell lines hadn't given you a pretty satisfactory model. Um, the odds ratio, the ability of this, the, of this model, of this visible neural network to distinguish responsive from non-responsive cell lines to pelvis is, is an odds ratio of 40. There's, that's a screaming odds ratio. That's just not real. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, you know, it looks very good at the cell line level. Um, let's see if it translates to patients. So the other nice thing about doing the science like in 2023 or 2022 is we're just starting to have um, through public projects like Project Genie, through a few other projects, enough tumor genomes linked to patient outcomes that we can actually do these tests, okay? Um, uh, without having to, you know, generate data de novo. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, so, so uh, you can see, oh, I apologize. that. that that hasn't made the translation to PowerPoint or something, but uh, but uh, you can see there's 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 a uh, hundred or so uh, uh, patients who got CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, um, all of this is plus endocrine therapy. Here are patients that just got endocrine therapy. Again, I apologize; those numbers dropped out, but you get the idea. And now, what what the model does is it uses what it's learned uh, over here. To, uh, to predict, uh, we simply bend our, our continuous response prediction into sensitive, partially resistant, and uh, strongly resistant. Importantly, we also used an undefined category. If it's right in the middle, we'll just we'll treat that sort of as a, I don't know. Okay, and, and, and that generally as a regime has worked pretty well for us in a number of different drugs, not just palbociclib. And here you can see that the strongly resistant category, there's really no benefit of, of palbociclib. Um, people I've shown this to say, well, hey, the partially resistant, they still have, you know, they're still responsive. Um, and, and, you know, and importantly for establishing this is probably an interaction with the drug and not just genotypes that predict poor or good cell growth or, or tumor growth. Here is what your survival separation looks like. Uh, if you just, if, so this, this model thinks these patients got palbo. Okay, so it's trying to say who's going to respond and who's not. No one got palbo. And so uh, you'd like to see that the model isn't separating that patient population, and it's not. So that indicates a drug interaction that's probably going on. Um, okay, so now we, so the model's predictive and we can translate it, um, I, and to PDXs as well. I, I said, let me skip over that because I want to end here in a couple minutes. Um, but now let's talk about what I think the model's sweet spot really is, which is not so much prediction. Of course, that's got to be respectable, but it's interpretation. Because now what I can do is go back to that hierarchy of protein complexes, and it's much easier to interpret what went on for why a cell line or a PDX or a patient was predicted to be a non-responder to CDK4-6 inhibition. Um, and, what I'm and I'm glossing over a lot, and it's still a hard problem, actually. Um, we've you know, so, so, you know, Algorithms like deep lift, you know, you know, come and in, come into play here. But but you uh, but conceptually, it's simple. You you simply look at the protein complexes at their at the artificial neurons representing their activity, uh, 
and you simply look, is the activity of that protein complex changing um, even from patient to patient when I'm predicting a response or a non-response? Uh, so here we're summarizing over all uh, of the samples, uh, uh, what are the most important complexes in which mutation push around your response? Okay, that's, that's the idea. As a positive control of sorts, there is where the drug target is itself. There's the, C, there's the protein complex that's been named, not by ChatGPT, by, by probably Go Enrichment. In that case, uh, it's very well known. Uh, the CDK holoenzyme complex one, that's what that hairball looks like in the proteomic uh, analysis and the structural model, right? Um, so there's, there's the actual CDK4-6, uh, you know, cyclin complex. You got to kind of deconvolve these based on what you, on the known biology. So there's the, there's the inhibitor of, there's the inhibitors of that upstream. Um, there's the downstream repressor that that's repressing, um, and so on and so forth. But it's, it's all there. And it's no surprise that mutations in, in that assembly or that collection of proteins might modulate your, your palbo response. But what else do we got? And it turns out we have a lot. We have about 80 proteins organized into uh, you know, third as many complexes um, in which mutations, many of which have not been recognized before, are argued by the model to govern uh, the response. And so here's an example where we're, you know, we're trying to dive deep into, of course, one of these to get this paper published. Um, and, uh, here, and this one's related to uh, here. This is, this is uh, pre-ChatGPT, our name that we spent like hours <laughs> trying to figure out what to call this thing. Um, it, in a sense, it, it, you know, it, it puts together some expected pieces. So here's histone acetylators. Here's uh, proteins re either directly related to histone deacetylation or, 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 relate or, or indirectly. And then here are some downstream potentially transcription factors, some DNA uh, uh, or gene specific, some general. Um, OK, um, so we have a big chromatin complex. Uh, now, what, what, how is it being used to predict drug response? Well, uh, let's first go into uh, you know, the, the patient data now and look at, at how it's altered. And what you can see here is, and, and this is the one, uh, Mick is well or is reasonably well known in the pelvic lib response um, uh, literature to, to, uh, in, in which amplifications make you resistant. Um, but we also, so those are amplifications, okay, in patients. You get some amplifications in TERT. Um, moderately interesting, actually, but then really interesting were, to us were these two proteins, CAT6A, okay, a histone uh, acetylation enzyme, and TBL1XR1 down here, okay, in which uh, pan cancer, it's about 10% of patients have copy number amplifications in these two proteins. Um, and of course, it's, it's greater in some, in some diseases, sub subtypes of cancer. So then we went in um, uh, and uh, used CRISPR amplification. To it's the last slide. Uh, uh, to to overexpress those those genes, phenocopying or see if they phenocopy what happens when they're amplified. Um, it, it was actually reasonably hard to find cell lines that haven't already amplified some gene in this pathway. Um, but in in cell lines where you where where it's relatively clean in background uh, uh, for these these genes. Uh, so here's what happens when you hit uh, 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 the cell line with a uh, and this is A549s, I believe, again. Uh, here's what happens when you hit the cell line with palbo. You're looking at EDU positive cells. So this is cells making it through and replicating their DNA. So they're making it through cell cycle. Um, when you hit it with palbo, that's the expected result. It should stop that. OK, and it does. But now look what happened when I hit, when I hit cells with palbo that are overexpressing either tbl one xr one or CAT6A. I still, you know, palbo has some effect, but it's, it's very much mitigated. Okay, so there's cells escaping uh, uh, that effect. And so, you know, this is as far as we've taken it for this paper, but we think that at least provides, you know, suggestive evidence that these, these are important uh, uh, alteration events in, in modulating drug response. Okay, so to, to, to summarize um, very quickly, uh, you know, the first half to thir uh, two thirds of my talk was structural. You know, and it was about integrating multimodal data on imaging and, and, and proteomics to build these maps of cell objects that one can resolve in cells and do it in a fairly systematic way. Okay, of course, there's lots of questions that, that now, now appear, right? And we can get into some of those. Um, and then in the last third of my talk, I, I moved to use those maps in, in, um, in efforts to interpret the cancer genome. Um, 
lots and lots, I've already acknowledged UA, uh, lots and lots of, of folks in the lab uh, who contributed to this work. And, as, and I, think I've, I, I think I did a pretty good job along the way of, of, of acknowledging everyone. Um, this work was funded uh, by uh, three grants in particular, a Schmidt Futures grant, actually, uh, Bridge to AI, uh, this, common, this new Common Fund initiative, and this Cancer Assistance Biology Consortium of the NCI. Thank you. Thank you very much, you Trey, three for minutes a really the wonderful hour, talk. You know. yeah. yeah, I wanted to have enough time for questions. So, Manolis. So, Trey, always very inspiring and fascinating talk and, and great work. So, I want to go back to the implications a little bit of this for Go and for NeoGo and for all of these kinds of embedding uh, representations of knowledge. So, basically, um, my, my, my question is, you know, I, I had dinner last night with a whole group of curators <laughs> who are basically wondering, you know, what's what's what in we, there. What do we do? Yeah, what's in it for them? Yeah. And um, my question is, are we at the point that we kind of maybe should, because uh, on one hand, you could say, oh, all these embeddings are going to replace Go, and who needs all these hierarchies, and we can just like ask ChatGPT to just one, summarize the like, function. As we did there. Yeah. Right? Now, the now, other approach is Go, having the network in the tree tells you so much more than simply having you know a, a short description because it allows interpretability. So I'm just wondering about how these two worlds coexist in your view going forward, like two years, five years. So, so in my view, you want the hierarchies. The first two thirds of my talk was about building those exactly, but from directly from data. So not by scraping the literature. That's the answer. To me, the biggest question with GPT is what does it actually know? They're always very um, conscientious about telling you, you know, open AI. It's very conscientious these days about saying what's not in their fundamental, you know, corpus, right? But they don't tell you what's in their fund. So, so you know, it's citing papers from New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, that's behind a paywall. How does it know that? Did they? I mean, is is that on uh, PMC Central? Are they are they reading papers that are publicly available in PMC? You know, I think we we need to kind of know that. But let's assume you had a bot that could read all the literature. Which, which it sort of has, right? Maybe you just ask it. Maybe, you know, maybe you... Anyway, it's a longer discussion. Questions? There is a microphone there. Can you just use that? Great talk. So in the study that combined joint embeddings of the affinity purification tandem mass spec and the immunofluorescence images, what would happen if you just looked at the immunofluorescence? Because it seems like that tells you a lot more about spatial proximity, which I assume your embedding tried to conserve at lower dimensions than just whether they're in complex together. Yeah. So what what exactly is here. the value add of the tandem mass specs? It's that, that'll tell you whether things are in a complex, but not necessarily their spatial exact spatial proximity. Yeah, so, it, so it's, it's absolutely required to infer a lot of these objects. If you get rid of one data, so, so she did this. She dropped out one data type and then looked at what dissolves, right, when you do that. And predictably, well, and, and also to even gate this whole project, she had to show that there's some common signal to be found. Okay, there's a question of how much common signal to be found. And you can, you can go back and make statements like only about 30% of APMS interactions are in the same compartment of the cell. You can discuss what the implications are that you know of, of that longer than I have time up here. Okay, but but uh, an interesting answer is nonetheless. If I look at what drops out um, when I drop out mass spec, I typically drop out small complexes. I don't find them in the imaging. When I drop out imaging, I lose structure up here. There are surprises, though. I can rediscover a damn mitochondrion in APMS data. It's a massive, it's like a, it's like a massive hairball. Not the best way to discover a mitochondrion, to your point. But I, it's there, OK? Um, so I, I, I actually don't drop out everything, is what I'm trying to say when I drop out you know, one, you know, one data type or the other. But you, but you see a nice complementarity, as you'd expect. Imaging is better powered up here. Mass spec is better powered down there. Cool. More questions for? Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, my question is related to the, the gene set stuff you were doing. So maybe like two questions. One is maybe more like a thought experiment. But if you could 
break down the training data by decade. If you go back into the abstracts and the knowledge graphs and go, you know, by decade or pre-genomics era and post-genomics era, how do you think the performance would um, vary and are we reaching saturation? I, mean, I have I doubt no it. idea and that's a fantastic question. So you could actually analyze what GPT is citing. Is what yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the second question related to what GPT is citing. If you look at like I liked your task of asking GPT to give back the citations. So in the citations where it's supporting, like you found a term that's very similar to the Go term, yeah. do those abstracts tend to have more like um, causal words like regulate or mutate? And, you know, in the ones where it's doing really poorly, maybe it's more like GWAS studies or more another, another great idea. And I will have, I, I will, I will have Clara, I will make that suggestion that she, she take a look. I mean, one thing I can say that, you know, I can answer your question in an indirect way, um, which is, uh, you know, if, if you look at what Go term, so, so we try to systematically test this thing in both literature curated gene sets from Go and omics derived gene sets where you, where you don't necessarily have the answer in the literature, or at least in, in, in Go. Um, but let's just focus on Go, which is really your question. If I look at, at, at how much of Go can I just feed it that gene set and get pretty close to, to the name that the Go curators chose, the answer is for half of Go terms, I almost nail it, okay? Um, maybe it's just because it has Go in its corpus, right? But for the other half, I don't, okay? And then the question is, is it a total miss or, or how, how do I assess that miss? And semantically, it's a total miss. Meaning, if you look at semantic similarity, you know how, how similar in the English language the phrase it gives is to the phrase the Go curators gave. It's not at all. Okay, but if I look at the gene, if I then take the phrase that it gives and map that to what is the nearest semantically similar Go term, if you still follow me, that gene set actually recovers the original gene set. What I said actually was true, but it's confusing. And anyway. It's interesting, so now I have the case that I have two Go terms that share almost the same gene set, but they have totally different semantic names. I don't know what to make of that. Thank you. So with this, I think yeah, what we'll do is stop it in here, but we will continue discussion outside because I know that Katie and Elizabeth organized for us some wonderful treats so that we can actually continue the discussion outside and build more community among all these different groups that came here together today. So thank you very much, Trey, for a really wonderful talk. Thank you.